Hi, and welcome to UOA On Demand. I'm Dr. Gino Chiapetta, spine surgeon with University Orthopedic Associates. I'll be joined by Dr. Matthew McDonald and Dr. Ravi Verma, my two spine colleagues in our practice. And our topic today, we'll be talking about common cervical spine conditions we see, particularly with herniated discs and degenerative disc disease of the cervical spine. So the cervical spine, uh, the neck is one of the most common areas we see in practice. And there's a host of conditions that we see, including patients with neck pain, herniated discs, degenerated discs, a whole host of different conditions. So let's start by talking about the most common things we see and common things that may often lead to surgical procedures. So Matt and Robbie, tell us about the things um, you see in practice and things that may uh, lead to surgical intervention. So uh, commonly people will come presenting with cervical spine conditions uh, they'll report some kind of neck pain and or some kind of shooting arm pain. Um, sometimes that can result in numbness or weakness or burning sensation, tingling or uh, other aspects of, um, of discomfort. And uh, this can be brought on by an injury. It can be brought on by something uh, simple that uh, you know, doesn't have a specific uh, start point. And, uh, you know, we'll start the workup with the history and physical, get some imaging like an x-ray or even uh, an MRI to confirm the diagnosis and try to figure out treatment options based off of that. Okay. So Matt, let's talk about some of the things we see um, that we see on MRIs and x-rays, talking about herniated discs and other commonly presenting symptoms that patients will typically see in the office for. This is one of the most common findings that we'll, we'll, we'll diagnose when we go through the sort of workup process is, is a cervical disc herniation. And as Dr. Verma was mentioning, um, it's a common condition. It, it results in a fair amount of pain. Uh, often symptoms include neck pain. Very commonly patients will report, you know, sometimes severe, you know, burning pain that radiates from the neck into the shoulder, into the shoulder blade, often down the arm further. And sometimes there are other associated neurologic symptoms with these conditions like numbness, tingling, even occasionally weakness in you know, one or two of, of the uh, muscle groups. So, so that's a cervical disc herniation. And that, that is a diagnosis that gets made um, uh, most commonly by an MRI. And really a, a cervical disc herniation is, 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 is an injury to the disc where you know, the disc is a, sort of a soft, cartilaginous cushion between vertebral bodies or, or two bones. And when the disc is injured, oftentimes a piece of that cartilage can, for lack of a better word, herniate uh, uh, into the spinal canal or nerve tunnels. And it can cause irritation or compression of either the spinal cord or nerve roots, which is why it manifests as with these symptoms that we were, we were discussing. So that's probably one of the most common things that we'll see and treat here um, at University of Orthopedics. You know, you mentioned a lot of times these are occurring damaged discs, which is true. Usually perfectly, uh, perfectly formed or perfectly healthy discs won't herniate, but this doesn't mean that these are always associated with an injury. Most times we can't explain it. It just spontaneously happens. Patients will go to sleep feeling fine, wake up in the middle of the night or in the morning with horrible radiating pain in their neck, shoulder blade, down an arm with tingling numbness that could be pretty unrelenting. Um, so let's, let's maybe talk about um, some things we see on MRIs and some of the common physical findings that we see. Um, so Robbie, take us through the, um, the typical uh, MRI findings that we can normally see on, on, uh, on these patients as well. So maybe some pertinent um, x-ray findings as well. Yeah. So on uh, x-ray, which we'll get uh, generally in the office, you'll see some signs of decreased disc height or some space area that is a little uh, lessened. You'll see some increased osteophytes or bone spurs or arthritic changes that can happen. Um, and this can sometimes give a clue as to which area may be most affected and maybe what is the problem that is uh, bothering them. Um, as uh, Dr. McDonald mentioned, uh, to properly or fully diagnose a disc herniation, you would need an MRI. And the MRI would show um, a bulge or a, a herniation of the disc uh, pushing up against either the central canal of the spine or even one of the nerve roots in the foramen or one of the nerve tunnels. Um, and sometimes this is at multiple levels and sometimes it's just at one level. And that's what some of the uh, diagnostic uh, 
rationale is to get these studies uh, to help kind of localize what is causing the pain and what is the um, location of the proposed treatments. And usually patients with cervical disc herniations present with one of two different kinds of clinical syndromes. You know, the more common one is what we call cervical radiculopathy. That's where the disc herniation pinches like an isolated nerve. And that is, you know, that presents with symptoms of shooting nerve pain and numbness or weakness that might involve one nerve and the muscles that that nerve affects. That's the more common presentation. But there are times that a really large herniation can also uh, compress the spinal cord where it starts to cause some spinal cord damage and dysfunction. And we refer to that as cervical myelopathy. And, and sometimes those patients present with more of these sort of like vague neurologic symptoms rather than pain. You know, a compressed spinal cord can result in oftentimes bilateral uh, hand numbness or tingling. Sometimes patients will report some clumsiness of the hands or, or lack of fine motor coordination of the hands. In more advanced cases, it could cause issues with coordination and balance. So the location of the disc herniation will sometimes impact the clinical symptoms that patients experience, whether it's symptoms of spinal cord dysfunction or symptoms of a compressed nerve root. Correct. And sometimes spinal cord compression, I'll often describe it as almost like heart disease, where you get these subtle symptoms and you don't really realize what it's coming from until you get like significant spinal cord compression, the symptoms really get exacerbated. And then you get really bad burning pain, uh, numbness in the, in the arms and hands, maybe some weakness of the hands. And people will generally describe maybe uh, uh, their walking being affected and their balance being affected. And those are definitely treated a little differently because the spinal cord, like the brain being part of the central nervous system does not have a very good healing potential, just like a stroke or a brain injury. Um, and prolonged um, symptoms can lead to permanent problems and they can become irreversible. So those we don't take too lightly. So what we're looking at here is our two MRI views of the cervical spine. This was a patient that was a 30 year old female who came to see me with uh, several weeks of uh, some neck pain, but more significantly she had uh, radiating arm pain. The pain kind of traveled into the shoulder region, uh, into the upper arm, bicep region to about the uh, level of the elbow. Uh, she did report some numbness or tingling sensations uh, that would travel down to the hand, I think in the region of her thumb. Uh, she thought the arm felt weak from time to time, although I wasn't really able to detect any weakness on physical exam. Uh, so at first, when I had seen her in the office, we, you know, initiated some measures to try to make her comfortable. You know, we put her on a short course of a steroid, on an anti-inflammatory medicine, gave her a muscle relaxant to kind of help her manage her symptoms. And we actually initiated a physical therapy program. Uh, she did physical therapy for a few weeks and had some, you know, minor to modest improvement of symptoms, but came back a few weeks later with, with you know, still a fair amount of, of discomfort and, and, and numbness symptoms, which prompted us to get an MRI. And this is her MRI here. So the image to the left is kind of like a side view. And, and what you can see on the side view is over in this region here are the, the bones of the vertebrae of the spine, which are separated by these spaces, which are the discs. Behind that is the spinal canal. So this gray long tube coming down is her spinal cord. And we see some white spinal fluid, you know, kind of bathing and surrounding the spinal cord. And this line here is coming through the, uh, the, the C5, C6 disc. And what you can see on this side profile view is that there is disc material here, which we refer to as a disc protrusion or disc herniation sticking out into the spinal canal. So then what we like to do is, is look at the image, which I have pulled up on the right hand side of here, which is a cross sectional view. It's basically like a slice through the patient's neck but looking at it from the bottom up is, is, is the orientation. So this is actually the front of the patient's spine here. This is the back of the patient's spine here. And this gray sort of oval structure is actually the spinal cord and cross section. And what this cross-sectional MRI shows is this structure right here. This is a, a medium-sized disc herniation that in this patient's case is actually, you know, slightly indenting the right side of her spinal cord and it's sort of impinging the, the C6 nerve root, which is the nerve that takes off uh, from that section of the spinal cord. So this is sort of a common MRI finding. It's a, it's a nice depiction of a cervical disc herniation. And um, this is something that we see here very commonly. 
So on someone like this that's gone through treatments like physical therapy, some medications, maybe a cortisone injection known as an epidural injection doesn't help them. What's the thought process for someone like this who's younger, you said she was 30, who has a herniated disc with nerve and some spinal cord compression that's not getting better. Take us through like the conversation you have with the patient in terms of like where, what's next. So with a patient who's 30 years old presents with a disc herniation like that, presumably doesn't have a lot of arthritis, doesn't have a lot of neck pain. This is where you would start talking about finding ways to remove the discomfort they're having from the disc herniation without affecting maybe their biomechanics uh, going forward. So the options surgically we talk about are things like a disc replacement or potentially a fusion. These are done from coming from the front of the spine. So you scoop out that disc that's pushing up against the nerve and the spinal canal. And it's just a difference of what you're putting back in its place. Uh, somebody who is, has signs of arthritis, painful neck motion, they may benefit more from a fusion uh, where they're not retaining this painful motion anymore. But somebody who's younger, doesn't have a lot of neck pain, doesn't have a lot of neck arthritis and has um, some more time to potentially develop uh, something we call as adjacent segment disease or uh, abnormal motion at the levels above or below uh, may benefit from a disc replacement, which better recreates the natural body's biomechanics while taking out that disc herniation, which is actually causing the pain and the symptoms. And so that's a very nuanced discussion. And, and all three of us here at University of Orthopedic Associates, um, we do perform disc replacements, but it's all dependent on uh, your specific pathology and uh, if it makes sense for you in terms of the long-term treatment. So in, in terms of the, the different types of surgery, what's the success? What's the upside? Like, what's the selling point for these patients to consider it? So, um, you know, one thing I'll say is that, you know, the sort of the, the, the tried and true operation, you know, the way we've treated this, this condition for decades is, is the anterior cervical fusion or an, or an ACDF. And that surgery has historically excellent clinical outcomes, right? So I think it's super important to understand that um, we have this newer operation available and oftentimes for younger patients, you know, we sort of have this, you know, nuanced discussion about what is the best operation for this particular patient at this particular point in their life. But really what you have to realize is we're, we're, what we're both of these operations are amazingly effective. So we're choosing from two good options and we're just trying to figure out what is the best option for a particular patient at, at a particular point in time. Um, and there, you know, there were some really good large clinical trials done um, when cervical disc replacements were uh, being introduced and coming into practice. And, you know, those trials showed that, particularly for a, a, a one level disc problem, um, the cervical disc replacements achieved the same excellent clinical outcomes for patients as the fusions. Uh, but then they took it to a next level and they said, well, what about patients that have two uh, disc problems sort of occurring at the same time? And what they figured out for those patients is that, again, the cervical disc replacements achieve the same excellent clinical outcomes for patients. But in that group of patients, they actually find that there was some advantage to the cervical disc replacements because there were lower reoperation rates. And, and, and what, what they were talking about here are, are potential factors that are downsides to fusion. So one potential downside to a cervical fusion is that it does reduce motion of the fused part of the neck. And that can create increased stress on a disc, a normal healthy disc next to that region. So one thing that we do see sometimes is an otherwise healthy disc over time will deteriorate or degenerate. And we call that adjacent segment disease. So we think the cervical disc replacements will reduce the rate of developing adjacent segment disease. So that reduces further need for treatment down the road. And the other thing that can sometimes happen with a fusion is a fusion involves your own bone kind of healing and connecting the two vertebrae together through the bone graft that we put in place. And although fusion rates with one and two level ACDFs are very, very good, it's not 100%. And so every once in a while, a fusion won't take or won't heal. 
And if a fusion that's not fused causes symptoms like neck pain for patients, occasionally that will require some other sort of intervention to try to, to, to treat those symptoms. So for patients that are candidates for cervical disc replacements, we think it, it, it might be the better operation for the long term. And that's our understanding you know, at this point in time. The challenge is that there are, there are, um, there are sort of patients that are like ideal candidates for cervical disc replacement. And there are patients that have um, certain conditions or anatomy or things that sort of uh, prevent us from doing a disc replacement and an, and an ACDF becomes the better uh, operation for that patient. I don't know, maybe if, if one of you guys want to elaborate on those details a little further. Yeah, so, so you know, why don't you talk us through some of the, uh, the thought process you go through when talking to a patient and helping decide whether you want to go the fusion route or the replacement route or others. I, I think one of the biggest concerns and is almost you know, somewhat mythical is the worry about having a cervical fusion, the range of motion, a lot of patients have done three or four, you know, disc fused on uh, in a surgery, and the range of motion is not much change than what it was before surgery. Um, they have a good functional range of motion. They can drive fine. They can look up, look down, look side to side. Maybe they can't touch their chin to their shoulder anymore, but there's very few things in life that you need that kind of motion. You know, the majority of the motion in the neck is between the skull and first and second levels. So that's about 70% of your neck motion, which rarely becomes... Um, an area of, uh, of the spine that requires surgery. So if, you, if you're fusing one or two discs of the lower discs, say C5-6, C6-7, you'll maybe lose 5%, at most 10% of your motion, which is you know, a very minor amount. So I think that's one of the myths that, um, that we try to really instill in patients because um, that is the concern. And you know, when, it, when it comes to disc replacement, it was certainly something that it's, 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 it certainly has better outcomes in patients that haven't had chronic neck pain, that don't have a lot of arthritic changes of the joints in the back of the neck. These are called the facet joints because those facet joints will still have motion. And if there's some arthritic changes, as time goes on, the arthritis in those joints can progress and they still may have you know, neck pain with looking up and turning side to side. So it's one of the factors that we kind of take into account the preoperative symptoms, the length of, of neck pain problems, and the amount of arthritic changes they have on x-rays, MRIs, and or CAT scans. Um, and I think if it comes down to as many times as dealer's choice, you know, you could do one or two surgeries and the patient would have no idea which one you did because they feel exactly the same. There's definitely pros and cons to each. Um, and I think you just need to have an honest discussion with the patient in terms of the risks and benefits and the advantages and disadvantages. And I think um, by going through that thought process, the, the surgeon and, and patient can come up with a very well-informed decision. Yeah, I, th I think, I mean, that's a good point. Like, like regardless of which operation we choose, patients are going to get better. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I, I sort of view like the, the, like sort of like the, the most favorable candidate for a cervical disc replacement would be like a one level or two level disc herniation. Uh, it's a focal herniation, meaning it's, it's a piece of dish that came out. There's not a lot of bone spurs compressed in the nerves. Patient, you know, just has, you know, nerve pain, maybe on one side, they're a younger patient. And as you were alluding to, there's not bad arthritis, because if there's bad arthritis, particularly in the joints of the back of the neck and a lot of chronic neck pain from that, when we put a disc replacement in and, and restore motion and sometimes increase the motion, that could actually result in sort of worsening pain due to a flare up of those arthritic facet joints. So, so for that patient, oftentimes diffusion is the better operation to address sort of all the symptoms that they're coming in with. And there, and there's definitely patients that, that do much better with effusion or require effusion. If you have advanced arthritis and large bone spurs, you're probably gonna do better with effusion. If you have, if you have more than one or two discs that need to be fixed, you need a spinal fusion. Uh, if you have alignment problems with your neck, you know, what we call kyphosis or a cervical deformity, you're going to do much better with the fusion. But luck, luckily, uh, it, it's nice that we have both, you know, two good options to choose from and, and discuss both options with our patients. And I think that's important too, that, you know, we spend the time with our patients to kind of individualize and personalize and tailor the approach, depending on your specific factors, your uh, goals in terms of what you're trying to get back to. You know, I treat younger patients or people who are heavy laborers or do a lot of physical activity different than I'm treating older patients or people who have more arthritic changes. 
and those are some of the things that uh, affect it, or if you have some kind of uh, systemic uh, factor that can affect it. Um, smokers, as Matt was pointing out, um, your bone has to heal and fuse. Smokers, we know, have a decreased rate of fusion, so that may point you in one direction or another, um, as long as, uh, along with a whole host of other um, factors. And so it's important that, you know, you spend the time and point out these different things and have this personalized conversation with each patient so that both of you can come to an informed decision together. Sure. So, so maybe we'll uh, go back to my patient and kind of look at what we did. Is that okay? Yeah, I was gonna say, um, I have a model here of the- uh, Oh yeah, let's look, at that. let's look at that first. So, you know, I have with me a, a model of what a cervical disc replacement looks like. Here is it. Um, in a spine model. So basically it's formed from, uh, on the bone itself will be, the, it will be composed of metal, usually titanium. And then in the center is what, uh, what we call polyethylene. It's a very highly specialized plastic, very similar to what's used in uh, knee uh, replacements and hip replacements. And what it does is it articulates, it moves all together as one. So it maintains all the natural motion of the neck. Um, but again, uh, the, these maintain the motion, but if you fuse the joint, you're only going to lose about three to five percent per disc level. But this is exactly what it looks like, and uh, we'll uh, turn to Dr. McDonald to look at maybe some post-operative imaging and what his patient, um, um, the final result of their surgical um, procedure. Okay, so so this is uh, my same uh, 30-year-old patient with the C5, C6 disc herniation that uh, we showed a little earlier. These were her initial x-rays, which I show to kind of highlight the fact here that, you know, she didn't really have much in the way of degeneration or arthritis. If we look at the spaces between her vertebra, they're kind of like nice, tall discs. They're kind of uniform heights throughout. You know, she has, you know, reasonably normal cervical alignment. So being a young lady without any factors that um, um, would sort of demand or require a fusion, you know, I offered her the cervical disc replacement surgery. And this is a post-operative x-ray that was obtained uh, at her first follow-up visit. So you can see we, you know, we approached her spine from the front. We removed the problematic disc and removed the herniation to get the pressure off her spinal cord and nerves. And we put in this implant, which is the cervical disc replacement. So like Dr. Chiapetta was showing, there's uh, this this, what we call this end plate. This is uh, sort of a metal polymer that rests on the bottom of C5. There's another metal piece that rests on the top of C6. And then what you can see is, is this uh, plastic peak uh, uh, component of the implant, which sits in between. It doesn't show up on x-ray, but basically this allows, uh, you know, continued neck range of motion. And there, there actually have been studies where you could reproduce normal neck range of motion uh, with the cervical disc replacement. So this is what her post-operative x-ray looks like. Well, how, what's the length of surgery for like say one level versus two levels? Yeah, so like a, a, a one level cervical disc operation probably takes an hour, maybe between an hour, hour and a half. I mean, that's surgical time. There's some additional time spent in the operating room. We monitor your nerves, anesthesia, x-rays, that kind of stuff, but probably between an hour, an hour and a half. Um, the overwhelming majority of these, when they're done in healthy patients, are actually done as same-day surgeries. So patients will have the operation usually first thing in the morning. We'll monitor them for a few hours in the recovery room afterwards, and they could go home you know, in the afternoon the, the same day. Uh, this woman was, was a teacher. Uh, she had this in the, in the spring, and she, I think if I recall, she only missed like a week and a half or so of work, um, which is, you know, I think, you know, a, a pretty typical return to work time if you're not doing like a big sort of manual labor kind of, of, of job or profession. Yeah, I think that's a very important point is that uh, a lot of people have one or two level disease and whether they're getting disc replacements or fusions at one or two levels, those are typically done as uh, an outpatient or a same day surgery type of uh, approach. Uh, and Dr. McDonald spoke about, you know, one level surgery taking about 60 or 90 minutes. A two level surgery will take about two hours or two and a half hours. Um, and uh, in a similar situation, you know, somebody who doesn't have any other major comorbidities will go home the same day. Um, and typically their uh, pain and, and uh, symptoms will improve. And generally speaking, they can get back to, to work and life 
relatively quickly and the success rate is pretty high with this kind of surgery. Some studies have uh, shown that uh, an anterior cervical discectomy infusion is on par with a total hip arthroplasty or total hip replacement in terms of the success rate and the patient satisfaction rate. And after this type of surgery, do these patients have to wear like a hard collar? And if so, for how long? I don't put patients uh, in, a, uh, in a hard collar for this kind of a surgery. I generally will provide them with a soft collar that they can use it for comfort if they feel more um, safe with it on or when they're out and they don't want people to bump into them, they can use that. But it's not imperative towards the stability or the structure. You know, that's coming from the inside and the operation that was done. Um, so people don't have to worry about being stuck in a dog funnel. So, it's, so if it's okay with you guys, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and show a slightly different case so we could highlight uh, another option. So this is a patient that came in. This patient was in his 50s. Um, he had a longstanding history of neck pain that required you know, treatment through the years, has attempted therapy in the past, different medications, uh, has even you know, attempted different you know, kinds of spinal injections to manage some chronic neck pain of his. And you know, it, it would be manageable most of the time. He would get these episodic flare-ups, do some treatment, and that's kind of how he, he got by for like you know, 10, 15 years or so. Uh, when he came in to see me, he had sort of a dramatic change and worsening in his symptoms. You know, he had you know, several months of not only a flare-up of neck pain, but also presented with uh, a lot of uh, newer nerve-related symptoms to the arm, a lot like our previous patient was experiencing shooting pain into the, uh, into the arm, numbness and tinkling. Uh, this patient had a little bit of weakness of his bicep muscle and one of his wrist muscles. So if we look at this gentleman's x-rays, we can see sort of a very different picture here compared to the, to the 30 year old woman. So, you know, th this patient's al alignment is normal. There's a nice sort of arch to the cervical spine here. Uh, the, the upper discs, C2, C3, which I'm highlighting now, C3, C4, which I'm highlighting now, look fairly normal and healthy. They're, they're fairly tall, uniform looking in height. When we come to C4, C5, we start to see some early degenerative changes. You see a little bit of a bone spur coming off the spine here. But look here at this disc at C5, C6. This is a very, what we call degenerated disc. Uh, the height of this disease has been lost. The disease is you know, nearly collapsed and is you know, essentially bone on bone. We see some bone spurs sort of growing off the front margin of the disc space here. And even on x-ray, you can see bone spurs kind of projecting off the back of the spine here. So this patient came in and, and, and I, I you know, right away was suspicious for this concept that he had a pinched nerve. But unlike my 30-year-old female who I suspected had a, like a soft disc herniation, I was you know, much more suspicious that this gentleman maybe had something a little bit more chronic going on. And sure, maybe he herniated a disc, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was you know, a bone spur was pinching a nerve or compressing a nerve. So this is his MRI. And if we take a look at the cross-sectional view, which is over here on the right-hand side, again, this is a slice through his spine. The front of his spine is here. The back of his spine is here. And we're looking through that spine from the bottom up. We see the spinal cord in cross-section here. Over here, this is the left. This is his left nerve tunnel. And you can see there's, there's some room here in this nerve tunnel, which is you know the room that frankly the nerve needs to exit and not you know develop any issues or problems. But what you can see here is kind of like a broad sort of bone spur and then off on the right hand side here, it's a little hard to say for sure if this is a bone spur or a disc herniation, but it's completely closing off that right-sided nerve tunnel. So he had pretty bad compression of that right-sided C6 nerve where it was trying to exit the spine through that, um, through that C5, C6 nerve tunnel. Yeah, so this patient went through our usual uh, attempts at treating cervical conditions without surgery. I think he, he had come to me had, and had already done a, a fair amount of treatment initially. Uh, he had sort of both the primary care doctor and a pain management doctor that had been prescribing different kinds of meds uh, like anti-inflammatories and muscle relaxants and a, a med that's sometimes used for nerve pain. Um, I don't remember what happened before he saw me if I referred him back. He wanted to try a, a cervical injection first called the cervical epidural injection where they inject cortisone into the neck. 
And uh, if I recall correctly, he had some temporary relief after that injection, but unfortunately that relief only lasted for a week or two. So we discussed surgery. Um, the, the thought process in terms of what was the best surgery for this gentleman was, was a little different. So some important factors here are that one, he has x-ray evidence of a fair amount of degeneration and arthritis of that C5, C6 level. And that's notable for, for a couple important reasons. One, we have to remove a fair amount of bone and bone spurs to adequately remove the pressure off of his nerve. And so uh, disc replacement is not favored in that setting. Uh, and the other important sort of consideration for this gentleman was that he had a, a, a longstanding history of, of neck pain due to the degeneration and arthritis. So for him, the idea of a spinal fusion where not only do we remove the bone spur, we remove the herniation to get rid of the nerve pain, but we stabilize this degenerated and arthritic area, it's much more likely to have a positive impact on his sort of chronic neck pain that he's had through the years. So this is this gentleman's post-operative x-ray. And so he had what we call a one level ACDF, that's an anterior cervical discectomy infusion operation. So we approached his spine from the front we removed the damaged disc and removed the herniation and bone spurs that were pressing on his nerve. You can see we were able to open up that disc height a little bit. That disc was previously really collapsed. And we, in place of that disc, we put a little piece of bone here, here called a bone graft. And this is sort of a titanium metal plate that gets affixed to the front of the spine. And this is the mm -hmm. fusion operation. So what will happen over time is that the bone graft that we placed will sort of act as like a scaffolding for bone. And over time, his body's gonna grow bone through here to, uh, uh, to achieve what we call a spinal fusion. And we've now eliminated motion at this damaged C5, C6 level. Mm -hmm. So I think many times too, patients are a little taken aback when we talk about surgery, we talk about when it comes to the front of the spine and they're like, when it come through my throat? And then there, people have researched it, it sounds a little counterintuitive because I think, you know, the neck, oh, you gotta come from the back of my neck to get to my spine. So Dr. Verma, talk to us about like the advantages and the thought process of why would you serve you from the front versus the back and the little difference between the two. Yeah, coming from the front is actually um, a very minimally invasive way of coming through to the spine in a sense that you're not stripping away any muscles. You're not uh, dissecting through any um, major uh, pain generators. You're really just splitting the muscles that are there and it, there's muscle planes that get us right down to the spine, as opposed to coming from the back, uh, if you came posteriorly into the cervical spine or even like we talked about in the lumbar spine, there's a lot of muscle stripping that has to be done and that can be a generator of pain. So um, over time, research has shown and, and experience has shown that Coming from the front is actually a much more tolerated procedure. There's much less pain that way, and uh, people do much better with that. Um, now, every approach carries its own risks, and so there are different risks coming from the front, and so patients can sometimes get some pain with swallowing. They can get some hoarseness of the voice, but generally these are temporary and will subside as the uh, trauma and the swelling from surgery will come down. Um, and generally speaking, patients recovery from this is pretty quick. And there are instances where you can't do the surgery from the front, the anterior part of the spine, where you have to come through the back. What was the thought process there and what, what are the expectations for the patients? Yeah, you know, there are times when uh, people have had prior surgery in the front already, or they've had some kind of uh, thyroid procedure or a lymph node dissection that may have created a lot of scar tissue where it's not safe to come from the front. Um, and that muscle splitting ideal approach is not uh, as easily accessible. Uh, so that may be a reason to come from the back to treat some of these issues. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, again, a way that we have to personalize or tailor the approach to each specific patient, depending on your own circumstances and your prior history of surgeries or uh, other procedures as well. Okay. And what are the take-home messages should we give to patients that have these conditions and um, are dealing with these problems, these symptoms, neck pain, arm pain? What's the take home message for these patients? 
you know, my take home is that, uh, you know, these are very common conditions that happen and um, it's uh, something that is very treatable. Most people actually do get better with conservative non-surgical uh, treatments, whether it be medications or physical therapy. Some people benefit from the epidural steroid injections that we talked about. And if you do require surgery, whether it be a disc replacement or, or a fusion, patients do generally very well with this as well. And, um, you know, we're all very well versed and skilled in all types of non-operative and operative management and the operation types. And so, you know, you can get a nice comprehensive tailored approach uh, coming to see us. Yeah, I agree. I think after 15 years in practice, I've probably done like a thousand fusions and a couple hundred disc replacements because it's newer technology. And it's not, not available to most patients because of their, their underlying condition that the patients by and far do do very well. The results show over 90% relief of arm symptoms. Um, it's just quicker recovery. They're back to work quickly. Um, they're back exercising quickly. Uh, the complication rates tend to be fairly small. Um, and so there's so much upside and um, something that uh, it's probably one of the most rewarding surgeries because typically you do the surgery and you see a patient in the post-operative recovery unit after surgery and they already feel like their arm pain is much better. The, 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 the numbness and tingling has gotten better. The, the strength starts coming back and you can see them like they, they just feel that relief already. They know that they're fixed. Um, and it's kind of rewarding and gratifying because you see the, the results like almost like the same day with gradual improvement. So I think it's extremely rewarding for us as surgeons and very rewarding for patients as well. Yeah, I would agree. I'd say, you know, one way or another, if you have a cervical disc herniation, we'll be able to get you better, whether it's with non-operative care or with surgery. And uh, it is rewarding. You know, patients wake up, they're, they're, the majority of their symptoms are often better right away. They usually say, hey, doc, when can I go home? <laughs> and we, we tell them we got to just keep an eye on them for a little longer to, to, to monitor them before we let them go. But I would agree with your, uh, both your sentiment. Yeah, and we understand that, you know, patient, not everyone needs surgery. Patients, a lot of patients do have apprehension about spine surgery because of the myths and misconceptions that they've heard through the grapevine or on Facebook or other social media platforms or through friends of friends. But, you know, we'd urge all patients who do have any any problems with their neck or experiencing symptoms of neck pain, arm tingling, arm numbness that's been ongoing. We certainly would ask you to visit us, you know, here in the office. We have several offices here at University Orthopedic Associates. Um, throughout central uh, New Jersey. You can visit us on our website at uoanj.com as well. Um, and I'd like to thank Dr. Ravi Verma and Dr. Matthew McDonald for joining me today on this topic, taking time out of the schedules to talk about this very common condition we see. And um, any, any one of the three of us be happy to see any patient in the office at any time um, for these cervical spinal conditions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.